Good afternoon to those of you who have logged in a couple of minutes early. Thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. And we will begin the workshop probably a couple of minutes right after the hour. Thanks again. Greetings everyone and good afternoon. We are right at four o'clock and we are going to hold off just a couple of minutes before we begin the workshop that we have uh, scheduled for today. Some people are still linking up and um, so we'll just wait another couple minutes. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, welcome and thank you so much for joining our workshop this afternoon. I think we have a critical mass assembled and we're gonna go ahead and start. So once again, welcome. This is the eighth of nine virtual regional workshops for advancing 30 by 30, the climate smart land strategy and equitable access to open space parks and nature. This workshop is being conducted by the California Natural Resources Agency, which you'll hear us sometimes call CNRA for short sometimes during this workshop. Today, we're really excited. We're in the inland deserts region. We're excited to have you join us and look forward to collaborating with you and importantly, hearing your perspectives. My name is Joan Isaacson and I'm one of the facilitators for today. And I'm going to share some quick housekeeping items with you. 
So first, I need to let you know that the workshop is being recorded for future viewing, and it will be posted on the website, which is www.californianature.ca.gov. We'll mention the website address a few times during the workshop this afternoon. And we are also streaming the workshop live on the CNRA YouTube page. Importantly too, this meeting is being interpreted in Spanish, Vietnamese, Cantonese, and Mandarin. If you need interpretation services, please provide your language in the chat or raise your hand with a raise hand function by clicking the reactions button. And if you're listening in on the phone, all you have to do is just dial star nine. In order to access the audio channel for any of these languages, please click on the interpretation button, which is a globe icon in the Zoom taskbar. The button will appear after we finish these instructions. These instructions will be repeated in all languages, and then you will be able to join the audio channel for that language. Again, at the end of these instructions, the interpretation button will appear, that little um, globe icon, and then you'll be able to select your language to begin interpretation. I'm now going to invite our interpreters to repeat these instructions in language, and first we'll hear Victor Hernandez, who is our Spanish interpreter. Thank you, Joan. Muy buenas tardes. Eh, le queremos dejar saber que esta reunión será interpretada en español, vietnamita, cantonés y mandarín. Para poder acceder al canal de audio de cualquiera de estos idiomas, haga clic en el botón de interpretación. Es el icono del globo o es un símbolo del mundo en su barra de tareas en la plataforma de Zoom. Después aparecerá un menú y entonces usted podrá seleccionar el idioma que necesite. Este mensaje se va a repetir en todos los idiomas y a continuación usted podrá unirse al canal de audio para su idioma. La interpretación entonces comenzará al final de este mensaje. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you so much, Victor. And then next we're going to hear from Tiffany, Long, Tiffany Tong. She is our interpreter for Vietnamese. Tiffany. Thank you, Charles. Um, tên, uh, xin chào quý vị. Tên tôi là Tiffany. Uh, chào mừng quý vị đến với hội thảo khu vực trực tuyến về những giải pháp dựa vào thiên nhiên. Xin đưa ra bất kỳ câu hỏi nào về kỹ thuật mà quý vị có vào khung hội thoại. Nếu quý vị cần các dịch vụ thông dịch, xin ghi rõ tên ngôn ngữ của quý vị vào khung hội thoại và chúng tôi sẽ đáp ứng nhu cầu của quý vị. Quý vị có thể chú ý thấy rằng nhóm chúng tôi sử dụng chức năng giơ tay bằng cách nhấn vào nút phản hồi để tham gia hội thảo bằng tiếng Tây Ban Nha, tiếng Việt, tiếng phổ thông hay tiếng quan thoại. Xin nhấn nút thông dịch ở cuối màn hình của quý vị, sau đó xin chọn ngôn ngữ của quý vị. Và một lần nữa xin quý vị nhấn vào cái quả địa cầu ở cuối màn hình bên tay phải để chọn ngôn ngữ. Cảm ơn quý vị rất là nhiều. Thank you, John. Our next announcement will be by our Mandarin interpreter, Kathy Wu. Hello, 大家好,欢迎来参加我们这个会议。我们这会议有西班牙语,越南语,国语和广东话的翻译。需要国语翻译,请按这个口译这个按钮在你的下方写一个像圆圈,地球仪的样子写着interpreting或interpretation。国语选Mandarin,广东华寻,Cantonese,想看英文字幕,就在西西,选西西在下面。谢谢,thank you. Thank you. And uh, next is Wei Tang, our Cantonese interpreter. Thank you, John. Um, 今次的会议是将会在翻译成西班牙语是Cantonese的 
Interpreters, thank you so much. We could not do this meeting without you. We now invite participants to join the interpretation audio channels and just click the interpretation button, which is again, is that globe icon in the Zoom taskbar. I also wanna let you know that closed captioning is also available. If you'd like to use this option, please click the closed caption icon in the Zoom taskbar at the bottom of the screen and then select subtitles to view subtitles that flow across the screen, or you can click on live transcript and see a full transcript in a side panel. Because we um, are having large numbers of participants in these virtual workshops, which we're very grateful for, we are generally keeping our participants muted during the workshop and will be primarily having participation and soliciting input via polling. No video is required. If you need technical assistance at any time, please contact our awesome technical support team by using the chat button in the Zoom bar. And I also wanna just let you know that during the workshop, Various uh, links and announcements and information will be shared in the chat box, so you might want to keep your eye on that. Participants can also request test technical assistance by using the raise hand function. And the location of raise hand on your Zoom screen can vary sometimes. So if you have the latest version of, of Zoom, the raise hand function is in the reactions taskbar. Otherwise, you'll be able to find raise hand in the Zoom taskbar at the bottom of your screen or at the bottom of the participants tab. And again, if you're on phone, all you have to do is dial star nine. It's super easy. We do have some tips for productive workshops. Again, because we have um, a large number of people participating today, both virtually via the webinar and by phone, we wanna make this workshop as productive as possible for everyone. And so as we move through the workshop, please keep a couple of tips in mind for a productive session. Please be respectful to each other and the workshop agenda and the objectives. Threatening profane and inappropriate language is not allowed. And then disruptive participants will be removed from the workshop. So we thank you and we invite your cooperation in making this a productive meeting for everyone. On to introductions. Facilitating today's workshop with me are Jenna Torje and Debbie Schechter. And then joining us for, from the California Natural Resources Agency are Jennifer Norris. Jennifer is the Deputy Secretary for Biodiversity and Habitat. We also have Amanda Hansen. Deputy Secretary for Climate Change. And then Mark Gold, Deputy Secretary for Oceans and Coastal Policy and Executive Director for the Ocean Protection Council. These nine regional workshops are designed to ensure that the state hears from a broad section of stakeholders across the state and hear your vital interests and in how California achieves our goals for conserving 30% of our lands and coastal waters by 2030, accelerating nature-based climate solutions and advancing equitable access to nature for all. Our objectives for the workshop today are threefold and include providing an overview of nature-based solutions and relevant action items in Governor Newsom's Executive Order N8220, Introducing the Natural and Working Lands Climate Smart Strategy and Pathways to 30 by 30 with equity considerations throughout. And then most importantly with these workshops is hearing from you, hearing your regional perspectives and your ideas as it pertains to the inland deserts. Again, we're really excited to be in this region. In our workshop today, we'll spend about 40 minutes providing you with updates. And then the rest of the time will be devoted to conducting polling activities that are gained to gather your insight experiences and your ideas. After brief presentations by Secretary Wade Crowfoot, Jennifer Norris, Amanda Hansen, and Mark Gold, we will then kick off the public engagement portion of the meeting with a poll 
to learn about you and your priorities. We'll then break into three smaller groups to engage in interactive polling, asking a range of questions on a variety of topics. And I'll tell you, the breakout sessions go by quickly. Please respond to our polling questions as concisely as possible so that everyone gets a chance to contribute. We want and need your experiences and your ideas as we work together to create substantive long-term strategies that the state will implement to achieve this goal. Now, I'm gonna turn this over to Jennifer Norris to share a tribal acknowledgement. Thank you, Joan. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I am Jennifer Norris, Deputy Secretary for Biodiversity and Habitat at the California Natural Resources Agency. I want to start our meeting here today by acknowledging the importance of tribal communities in this process. Our tribal partners are integral to achieving the goals set forth in the governor's executive order. We know that by working together, we can further safeguard the environment, preserve tribal cultural practices, and strengthen relationships between the state and tribal nations. The resources agency is currently engaging tribes through government to government consultations. In addition, Soon, we will be holding tribal listening sessions to engage tribes, solicit tribal input, and explore opportunities to collaborate. <clears throat> we look forward to working with our tribal partners and encourage those who would like to connect with us on tribal issues to visit our website to see a schedule of the listening sessions. Please visit our website at www.resources.ca.gov. We want to acknowledge also any elected officials that joined today. Thank you so much for your participation. Public engagement is critically important to the state, even as we continue to navigate the COVID-19 pandemic. And we know that virtual meetings, they're not the ideal way to have a conversation, but we didn't want to delay this very important work on 30 by 30 and climate smart lands. So while this isn't how we envisioned, we do hope these meetings can be productive and positive for everyone involved. Collaboration is essential to achieving the goals outlined in the executive order. As we begin our conversations today, I want to underscore our commitment to engaging all voices, all perspectives, and to advancing equity in everything we do. <clears throat> we begin today with opening remarks from Wade Crowfoot, Secretary of the California Natural Resources Agency which protects and manages California's natural resources, including our forests, rivers and waterways, coast and ocean, fish and wildlife, and energy. Now here's Secretary Crowfoot. I'm Wade Crowfoot, our California Natural Resources Secretary. Welcome and thank you for joining one of nine virtual regional workshops to advance nature-based solutions uh, across our state. Last fall, Governor Newsom issued an executive order that elevated the role of nature in both combating climate change, maintaining and protecting our biological diversity, and achieving more equitable access to our outdoors. In our agency, the Natural Resources Agency, we're really excited about the governor's leadership that's of course matched by our legislature uh, on expanding uh, environmental conservation across our state to achieve these multiple objectives. We live in a remarkable state, uh, known around the world for our natural diversity of plants and animals, uh, topographies, ecosystems, and our cultural diversity, where we are succeeding and thriving across all conceivable differences uh, within our human species. The work that you'll be involved in and the input you provide will ensure that looking forward in coming years and decades, we craft smart, ambitious, but achievable strategies to expand environmental conservation and utilize nature in the fight against climate change. In that executive order that Governor Newsom issued last fall, he called for conserving 30% of our state's land and coastal waters by 2030, which we call the 30 by 30 target. He also called for the development of a climate smart land strategy so we can understand how we better manage both our natural and working lands to 
to both remove carbon from the atmosphere and uh, protect people and nature from the impacts of climate change. The best ideas we have and the most effective actions <clears throat> will achieve multiple benefits. Uh, at the same time, uh, combating climate change, preserving biodiversity, and expanding recreational and outdoor access for all Californians. We know there are no one-size-fits-all solutions from Sacramento for this work, and our regions are so different in both the challenges they face and the opportunities they offer that these regional workshops are really critical to help us understand what is the situation in your part of California? What are <clears throat> critical priorities uh, in this area that we need to address? What are challenges you face to environmental conservation and climate action and equitable access? And importantly, what are opportunities for our state agency and more importantly, our state government to help you seize these opportunities in your region to expand equitable, thoughtful, sustainable, balanced environmental conservation. So we're really excited with your participation and look forward to these regional workshops figuring in and informing uh, both the strategy for the achievement of the 30 by 30 target and our climate smart land strategy uh, coming up in recent months. Really appreciate uh, all that you do uh, in your own lives uh, on these important topics and very excited to hear from you uh, today and in coming weeks and months. Thank you. Okay, everyone, I'm gonna hop in here. My name is Amanda Hansen, and I'm gonna provide some background on why Governor Newsom issued an executive order on nature-based solutions, what nature-based solutions are and why they matter. And I'm also going to just sort of tee up one of the two deliverables in the executive order that Secretary Crowfoot just outlined the natural and working lands climate smart strategy and then i'll hand it off to jen who will talk about our 30 by 30 effort so climate change and biodiversity loss are among the top five threats humanity will face in the next 10 years as we know all too well california is not immune to these crises last year alone wildfires burned over 4 million acres in california lives were lost homes and businesses were destroyed, public health suffered from hazardous air quality, and nature we treasure is gone. These fires took place in the middle of a deadly pandemic and heat wave, and on the heels of the most extreme drought in the state's history. California is considered one of the world's 36 biodiversity hotspots because of its concentration of unique species that are also experiencing unprecedented threats including climate change. The governor issued the executive order in direct response to these threats and outlined a very comprehensive and results-oriented nature-based solutions agenda for California. Which brings us to what are nature-based solutions and why are they important? When we talk about nature-based solutions, we are talking about actions that work with and enhance nature to help address societal challenges and they're important because they provide so many benefits, many of which we depend on for our well being. This slide shows a few examples of nature based solutions that address climate change and protect biodiversity. The circular image you'll see in the middle there is an example of community greening, which is a suite of nature based solutions that can cool communities facing reduce energy costs, allow soils to better absorb water expand access to nature, enhance biodiversity, reduce the impacts of pollution, and increase quality of life. The top right image shows wetlands and riparian areas which sequester carbon, reduce flood risk, they filter pollution, and protect habitat. The middle right image is an example of an agricultural nature-based solution. This hedgerow supports pollinators, improves habitat, conserves water, enhances our food supply, and contributes to our economic prosperity. 
And finally, the lower right image speaks to the many benefits nature-based climate solutions offer in our forests. Healthy forests reduce the threat of catastrophic wildfire and serve as a carbon sink for California. They also capture and clean our water supply, improve our air quality, they provide habitat for wildlife, and they support local economies. Today's workshop is focused on two deliverables that the governor's executive order called for. I'm gonna briefly outline the goals for our natural and working lands climate smart strategy and explore how it might support your regional priorities. Natural and working lands is the term we use in California to describe the nature-based solutions sector, which consists of the iconic landscapes we know and love. Our forests, wetlands, croplands, community green spaces, grasslands, deserts, and more. These lands cover 90% of the state's 104 million acres. Our lands offer significant opportunity to meet California's climate goals, but they've been kind of a missing piece of our state's climate agenda. So the natural and working lands climate smart strategy is intended to close this gap. And we're really excited to align relevant existing state efforts under one cohesive strategy and identify land management actions that help us to protect vulnerable communities, achieve carbon neutrality, improve public health and safety, and expand economic opportunity. So we're here today to learn about nature-based solutions for climate that are important to you and to understand how our statewide strategy can support this region's environmental, economic, and equity priorities. For example, the inland deserts region is known for its extreme heat, but the science tells us it's going to get much hotter in the future. This is going to have significant consequences for the region's communities, such as an increase in heat-related illnesses with disproportionate impacts on vulnerable communities. Are there nature-based solutions that can reduce these risks, such as increased tree canopy, community gardens, or green roofs? We also know this region faces major swings in the future between extremely wet and extremely dry years. This increases the risk of flash flooding, flooding and wildfire. So are there nature-based climate solutions you're considering to reduce associated risks, such as invasive species removal, habitat restoration, or through increased co-management of lands with tribes. Agricultural production and tourism are threatened by climate change. Are there actions that the state strategy can prioritize to support these sectors in adapting to climate change? Are there nature-based climate solutions you are successfully deploying that should be amplified in the state strategy? And finally, are there careers in the natural and working land sector that you'd like to elevate in the inland deserts region, such as habitat restoration technicians, community foresters, or carbon farmers, for example. Really looking forward to hearing from you all later. I'm gonna hand it off to Jen now to talk about 30 by 30. Thank you again for being here. Thank you, Amanda. <clears throat> Hi everyone again, I'm Jennifer Norris again, and I'm running point on the 30 by 30 initiative for the state. So as you've heard, our goal is to conserve 30% of our lands and coastal waters by 2030. And we want to do so in a manner that protects biodiversity, combats climate change, increases access to nature, and safeguards our economic sustainability and food supply. We're being purposeful in our approach. We want to conserve places that effectively protect the biological diversity of California, our unique plants and animals. We want to conserve lands and waters that meaningfully address climate change in the ways that Amanda outlined. And we want to conserve in a way that provides equitable access to nature and its benefits, like clean water, clean air, climate resilience, and of course, recreation. So what kinds of places are we talking about? Here are some specific examples from this region. The Imperial Wildlife Area. This 8,000 acre multiple unit wildlife area in the Imperial Valley provides rare waterfowl habitat and public hunting. 
As a major part of the Pacific Flyway, this site is visited by thousands of migrating ducks, geese, and other species every year. Fun fact, this area happens to have a remarkable concentration of mud pots or geothermal bubbling mud. For this place, the Pioneer Mountain Preserve, 25,000 acres in Eastern San Bernardino County. This preserve provides an important landscape linkage between Joshua Tree National Park, San Bernardino National Forest, and the Bighorn Wilderness. This preserve provides habitat for hundreds of species, including the desert tortoise, cactus wrens, tarantulas, and swallowtails. And its protect protected riparian areas serve as wildlife linkages and oases from the heat. And finally, the Mojave National Preserve, described as one of North America's most pristine natural landscapes. The 1.6 million acre protected area contains sand dunes and cinder cones, mountains and mesas. And I know I'm not supposed to say this, but it happens to be one of my most favorite places on earth. It's home to desert tortoises, bighorn sheep, mountain lions, Gila monsters, but honestly, its best feature is its silence. Achieving 30 by 30 will rely on the protection of diverse places like this across the state. Good conservation can happen on every conceivable land type and through lots of different strategies. And as the secretary said, one size does not fit all. At the end of the day, conservation happens locally, so we need to work to together. By February 2022, we will deliver our Pathways to 30 by 30 document, which will identify opportunities and strategies to achieve 30 by 30. It will also identify challenges to meeting our goals. This document is intended to set us on the path to successful implementation of 30 by 30. Today, we wanna to hear from you and hear about what's happening in your region to get your perspectives on what those opportunities and challenges are. We're interested to know how you think we should go about achieving 30 by 30. Which strategies to conserve lands and waters are most effective in this region? We wanna invest in successful approaches. Tell us what those are. At the same time, we'd like to know which strategies are more challenging and why, so we can work to address gaps. Your insights today will be used to develop our document and help us define what is conservation in California. You'll be asked later to share what conservation looks like to you. The executive order called for the establishment of this collaborative approach in recognition of the fact that partners across the state have experience and expertise that we can learn from. This conversation is the beginning of what we hope is an ongoing partnership. 30 by 30 isn't a new mandate and it won't be accomplished from the top down. By sharing your insights with us, we will learn how to be more effective partners. Our ultimate goal is for 30 by 30 to be what is to become what is called an open source movement for people across the state from a diverse array of sectors to commit to achieving 30 by 30 and to work with us in partnership. Thank you again for being here. I'm really looking forward to hearing your ideas. Now I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Mark Gold. Thanks, Jen. It's great to see such a good turnout this afternoon from inland and desert communities. I'm glad to be here today as we focus on some of the most pressing issues facing California's efforts to protect our natural habitats, combat climate change, and ensure biodiversity in this great state. For those of you not familiar with the Ocean Protection Council, we have a mission to ensure that California maintains healthy, resilient, and productive ocean and coastal ecosystems. The OPC works across various state agencies to coordinate activities related to ocean protection. And we also establish policies that facilitate the collection and sharing of scientific data, as well as identify policy areas that need to be addressed at both the state and federal levels. State waters run from the tide lines to three miles out and 16% of coastal waters are part of the statewide marine protected area network. There are 124 MPAs in that network. 9% of state coastal marine waters are protected through no-take reserves, and another 7% are 
or limited commercial and or recreational take MPAs. The MPA network is approaching a decadal review of this program by the end of 2022. And currently we are not looking at potential MPA expansion as part of the 30 by 30 path um, for the oceans, nor will we until after the completion of the MPA network decadal review. Our coastal regions and ocean are important ecosystems that are not only places where species thrive, but also serve as main attractions for California residents and visitors who want to enjoy the sand, water, and features of our coastline. These areas are also integral to our economy with aquaculture, energy generation, and the network supports up and down the state that are essential to the movements of goods in and out of California and the entire nation. Climate change threatens the coast and ocean with rising sea levels and ocean acidification. While other coastal resources suffer from the impacts of water pollution, harmful algae blooms, and habitat loss, we must take steps now to prevent further erosion of the coast and loss of rocky intertidal habitats, wetlands, and beaches, as well as the loss of kelp forests and the loss of precious marine life. In order to develop the path to 30 by 30 for coastal waters, stakeholder engagement will be critical to better define what conservation means for California's coastal zone and waters. As examples, California has 34 areas of special biological significance identified, three national estuary programs, three national estuarine research reserves, and four national marine sanctuaries that are critical for conservation. Most of these areas have additional conservation measures such as oil, gas, and mineral extraction bans in marine sanctuaries and pollution discharge limits in areas of special biological significance. We can look at these areas as potential candidates for additional conservation measures. Overall, this planning effort will enable California to develop practical and scientifically based strategies that will get us to 30 by 30 for our coastal regions and ocean waters. Thanks, and now back to Jen. Thanks, Mark. <clears throat> So if you watched our January webinar, you know that we have been working with ESRI on a geospatial information system called CA Nature. This system is being designed to be a publicly accessible suite of interactive mapping and visualization tools. CA Nature will bring together maps of biodiversity, climate change, and access, so we can view and analyze different features of the landscape in one place. This will allow us to identify places across California where we have the opportunity to achieve our biodiversity, climate, and equity goals. We'll also use CA Nature to assess what percentage of California is already conserved and track progress toward our goal. We are currently developing CA Nature using authoritative statewide data that we currently use or have access to. But of course, this is only the first version. We expect to expand this system over time, integrating new data that reflects changes in our understanding and knowledge. Some of you have been asking how you can provide your data for use in CA Nature. I want you to know that there is now a submission form on our website where you can provide information about the data you want us to consider for future versions. I will tell you that we're most interested in statewide information that meets our program objectives and meet strong scientific data and documentation standards. So stay tuned for future updates on CA Nature. It's gonna be pretty cool. And now I'll turn it back over to Debbie. Great, thanks, Jen. As you've heard from Amanda, Jen, and Mark, the state has been busy since Governor Newsom issued the executive order. Let's zoom out and look at where we've been and where we're going next. Since Governor Newsom issued the executive order last October, the California Natural Resources Agency and its partner agencies have made some important progress towards developing these strategies. In January, a kickoff webinar was hosted by the state that drew in over 800 interested parties. 
Also in January, the state began a formal consultation process with California Native American tribes, and we continue to host tribal listening sessions. We've been engaging with interested parties and stakeholders from around the state to hear perspectives and insights related to these efforts. In April, we launched a website to serve as a portal to learn and engage in developing the Pathways to 30 by 30 and Natural and Working Lands Climate Smart Strategy. Also in April, we released a public input questionnaire to gather experiences and ideas from a broad section of Californians. And today is the eighth of nine regional workshops to gain your input and perspectives. This summer, CNRA will convene several topical advisory panels to address key questions. Each advisory panel will produce a summary document that gives context to their topic area, offers technical or other insights, and provides key recommendations. Topics include issues related to climate change, biodiversity, defining conservation, and equitable approaches to this work. The panels will also present their recommendations in virtual workshops. We'll use the information gathered in the drafting of the Climate Smart Land Strategy document, which will be released this summer for public review and input. This important document will be finalized and delivered in October as we begin the next phase of this effort. Throughout the fall, we'll host another series of virtual engagements to update the public on the progress and invite more participation. And we'll also be drafting and releasing the other strategy document, Pathways to 30 by 30, for public review and comment. This document will be finalized and delivered in February 2022. To support this effort, we've launched a new website, which has been mentioned already, californianature.ca.gov, to serve as the portal of information about advancing 30 by 30 and climate smart lands. This new website features information about the executive order, how nature-based solutions work, ways to get involved through the regional workshops and other events, and a place to share your insights and ideas. We also launched an interactive public input questionnaire designed to solicit input that can be used to develop the two main strategy documents and to guide the work we must do as a state. Responses to this questionnaire are welcome until May 14th. And we want you to stay in touch. Please contact us via these multiple platforms, ask questions or provide your experiences and ideas. And now I'll turn it over to Jenna Torje for the Exploring the Region segment of this workshop. Thank you, Debbie. Um, now we're gonna move on to the portion of today's workshop that focuses in on perspectives in the inland desert region and provides an opportunity for all of you to participate in the process. So we're in the inland deserts region today, and for our purposes, the region consists of all of Imperial County, the majority of Eastern Riverside and San Bernardino counties. The inland desert supports a population of 1.2 million people. It has also experienced the fastest growth rate in California as of 2018, with an estimated 35.3% increase in population since the 2000 census. And about 28,000 square miles, the region is about 18% of the state's land area. The inland desert region, which is characterized by low mountains and arid desert valleys, includes natural lands highlighting the region's unique desert environment relative to the rest of the state. These include areas such as the Mojave National Preserve, as well as the historical and cultural resources found at Red Rock Canyon State Park. Tourism accounts for 6.2 billion of revenue, while agricultural revenues account for $4 billion of the region's total. Cattle, hay, and milk are its leading commodities, but the region is also known as the date capital of the United States. 
and that's the fruit. As you probably know, the inland deserts region is especially rich in natural lands. The region's land cover is predominantly shrublands and desert areas, together accounting for about 91% of the total. The remainder of the land area is made up of cropland, settlement, and treed forests. There is some groundwater recharge potential in the region, mostly north of the Salton Sea. The federal government owns a large majority of the region with the Bureau of Land Management, multiple branches of the Department of Defense, the National Park Service, Forest Service, and the Bureau of Indian Affairs combining to own 80% of the region's land. The remainder is owned by state and local governments, as well as some private land. We wanted to provide this regional snapshot before we dive further into our meeting. Your perspective will be important as we move to the next section where we, where we will engage with you and gather your input on a series of questions that will be used in developing strategies. So to get your experiences and ideas, we'll be using a software called Poll Everywhere. And there will be three ways to participate. You can participate by computer, by opening a browser window, and a browser is Chrome, Internet Explorer, um, Edge, Firefox, whatever you use to access the internet, and going to www.pollev.com slash kwpoll1. That link is in your chat box. It's also on the screen here. You can connect through your smartphone, you can open a browser window on your smartphone and type in the same address, www.pollev.com slash kwpoll1. And you can also participate by text message. So if you send a text message to the phone number 22333, that's 22333 with the message kwpoll1, that's k W P O L L one, you can respond there as well. We'll let you know throughout the meeting um, when to use your preferred option to respond to questions. And as we ask these questions, we really want to know what you think. This tool allows us to save your answers and inform the direction of this initiative. Before we move on to the next slide, um, if you are typing two words, together, put an underscore just for this question between those, uh, this question and a couple later, uh, an underscore between the two words, um, and that way we can see them together in the word cloud. So I'll have us move on to our first question. And the first question is, where are you located? Where are you located? So you can answer through your browser, through text on your phone, I see folks are in Riverside, people in the Coachella Valley, in Joshua Tree, Fontana, Glendora, Adelanto, folks joining us from Victorville, from Hesperia, from Corona, Indio, Los Angeles, And as these responses come in, I see a lot of people here um, joining, who are participating in the poll, joining from um, Riverside, Los Angeles, the Coachella Valley, Joshua Tree. We'll take another five seconds on this poll here. I see Paris, Yucaipa, Thermal, Moreno Valley, Mojave, the high desert. All right, I'll move us on. That's the Salton Sea. All right, I'll move us on to our next question. What sector do you represent? What sector do you represent? So this is on your browser window. If you refresh the page or if you're texting in, you can text in a letter here. Letter A, government, federal, state, local. B is tribal government or tribal community. C, business, investor, or labor. D is non-government, 
community-based organization, E, academic, F, general public. So I see some responses coming in here. We, we see the bar graph. It should be populating for folks who can see it on their screen. It looks like over half of folks on the call today, on the webinar today, are from non-government and community-based organizations. We have folks here from government, federal, state, and local. The general public participating in the poll, academic participating, and business investor labor as well. All right, let's move on to our next question. Our next question, if you refresh your browser window, um, when, when you think about nature or special places in this region, what comes to mind? Mojave Springs, Joshua Trees, the Salton Sea, and remember two words, do an underscore between the two words. Solitude, wildlife, the dark skies, Salton Sea coming in strong, desert tortoises, biodiversity, the Mojave National Preserve, and it's untouched, there's hiking. Open space, white water. We have such, uh, such rich responses here. Thank you everyone for sharing about na um, natural and special places in this region and what comes to mind. As the text getting smaller on the screen, I see the Salton Sea very clearly. I see Joshua trees. So everything you, um, this is a view of a word cloud, but everything that you texted in or you entered in your browser is captured for us. And thank you so much for sharing that. Um, all of these special places that come to mind in the region. We'll spend another five seconds or so on this slide. See the bighorn sheep, the San Bernardino mountains. All right, well, let's move on from here. I wanna thank everyone for your active participation in this plenary session of the meeting. But a key goal of this meeting is to further invite your input to help inform the development of the Natural Lands Climate Smart Strategy and the 30 by 30 Pathways document. And since we have such large number of participants, we will now transition into breakout groups so that your participation and input will be most effectively captured. So in the breakout session, we'll be asking you to provide your experiences and ideas in three areas regarding regional interests and current efforts, challenges and opportunities. So participants who requested interpretation upon registration will remain in this main accommodations room. And because you will be staying here, you will not get a prompt to join a breakout room. If you're a phone call-in user, you'll stay here as well. You will not receive a prompt to go to a breakout room. Other webinar participants will be randomly assigned to breakout room one, breakout room two, or assigned to this room as well. So if you don't receive a breakout invitation, you'll stay here with me. We will capture um, everyone's input in the two breakout rooms and this main room here. Similarly to how we've done in the plenary session, everyone will receive the same questions, just in a smaller group. And recognizing that the questions are high level and that we're asking you to share brief responses, we're hoping to get to common themes from the responses. And our intent is also to provide an opportunity for you to see and reflect on others' responses as well. And following the workshop, our facilitation team will compile all of the responses to all of the questions and prepare a meeting summary containing a synthesis of common themes. All responses will be treated equally and will be included in the meeting summary appendices. And remember also there's a public input questionnaire that is running parallel to these regional workshops. This this questionnaire is intended to provide interested communities and members of the public with a more detailed opportunity to provide targeted input to inform the development of the 30 by 30 pathways document 
and the Natural and Working Lands Climate Smart Strategy. So before we leave the breakout rooms and before my team assigns people, I want everyone on the meeting now to close your browser window that has the poll everywhere. You're gonna get a new poll everywhere link and we want you to be able to see the polls coming in from your own room. So close the link on your, on your browser or on your phone. If you've texted, text the word leave into your text chain or into your text message. So do those two things. And I'm just gonna take a couple seconds for people to close that browser window, type leave into your text messages into that same thread that you were texting before. And we will go into breakout rooms now. So team, let's go. And thank you everyone for the, your patience as we go off and do our breakout rooms or stay here in the main room with me. And if you receive an invite, click join. If you receive an invite, click join. Okay. It looks like people are being sent across the ether and in, into different breakout rooms. And many of you and our phone participants will be staying here with me. Thank you all for your patience as folks head to these different breakout rooms. All right. So I think. We'll get started. And as a reminder, if you got a, a request to go to a breakout room, click join and go to that breakout room. It'll be the same as here, or you can stay in here with me. Okay. So in this room here, we are welcoming um, folks who are dialing in from their phone only and non English speaking participants. And as a reminder, we are still recording this session and streaming it live on YouTube for others to view um, at a later time. We also have in this room here, um, Mark Gold. Mark, do you wanna say hi? Yeah, hello everyone. Um, hopefully uh, you enjoy this process and, and we really look forward to hearing what it's really important to you on biodiversity and access um, in natural and working land. So look forward to it. Great, thank you, Mark. Um, so we're still streaming live on YouTube and um, we are also, our interpretation services are going as well. So if you joined late to the room, you can look for interpretation instructions in the chat. So again, my name is Jenna Tourget. I'll be your facilitator during this session. And because we have phone only users and um, folks using the interpretation lines, I'm gonna have a bit of a monologue at the beginning. I invite you to be patient with me as we get through and we'll get to the questions pretty quick. Um, so at any time during the session, if you encounter any technical issues, you can text 760-690-7664. That number will be in the chat as well. And we recognize if you're a phone call-in user, um, you might not have the option to participate by computer. So we've designed this room to get your verbal input or your text input as well. We encourage text responses if you're reasonably able to do so and it doesn't cause any financial burdens. Uh, text responses allow us to more accurately capture your input. Okay, so. For this poll today, um, if you are, for these questions today, if you're a phone call in user, you can, um, if you do have a response to a question that you need to, to share verbally and not through text, you can dial star nine on your phone and that will be a raised hand um, notification to me and my team. And we will make sure to call on you. So press star nine on your phone and I'll unmute you. You'll have to dial star six, but we'll walk through it once you press star nine to raise your hand. Okay. Um, and we'll have, um, we'll monitor how many people are giving verbal comment and we'll make sure that we can um, 
get as much input as from folks as possible. As you can see on this slide, we have a new uh, we have a new poll everywhere link, and I'll have my team add that to the chat. It should be in there now. So this new link, if you open a browser window, uh, go to www.pollev.com/kwpoll2. So not kwpoll1, kwpoll2. The same on your smartphone, and if you're in your text message. Uh, 22333. You'll open up that text chain again or start a new text message and type KW pull two. That's KW pull two into that text message as well. These instructions will be at the top of the screen for every question too. So if you don't, um, if you weren't able to get it right here as we go into the next question, you'll see it there as well. You can also copy and paste from your chat link. So we would ask as we go forward, we have about 10 questions. We'll have about five minutes for each question. Um, and I'll let you know when we have one or two minutes left. We ask, um, you'll see as we go on to the next slide that um, I'll be able to see each of the responses coming on the screen, but there's only a limited amount of room. So I ask that you take your time in crafting your responses. We have time for it, but also if you have um, shorter responses, um, one to two lines would be great. You can break up your responses as well. So we can see those on the screen and read them out as well. Um, and if you have longer responses, the public input questionnaire is a great place for that as well. And as you're reading them, we invite you to reflect on what other people have said as well and offer responses um, and more ideas. And I wanna let you know, everything is being recorded, everything's being captured. And so you, if you write something in and I don't read it verbally or you don't see it on the screen, it is still coming in um, on the back end, and we have everything that you have responded to there. Okay, so let's go to our first question. Um, and we already have some answers in. So thinking about biodiversity in this region, what species, habitats or places are important to protect. So I see the de desert tortoise, the access to dark skies, bees, the desert pupfish. And I think people have picked up on that you don't have to put a, um, an underscore between your letters here because we're seeing them on the screen. I see the Western Joshua trees, watersheds and wetlands, the California desert ecosystem, wildlife corridors, aquifers, desert soil, desert soils, protecting dark skies again, the Sonoran Desert, the Salton Sea waterfowl. Salt and sea. All right, so we have our call in user, and I just like to remind our call in users that this question is thinking about biodiversity in this specific region. What species, habitats, or places are important to protect? I'll unmute you now. You can dial star six. Thank you. The California Department of Fish and Game noted 30 years ago that the Fenner, Ward, and Chemehueve valleys are likely the only area in the world where desert tortoises can have a self-sustaining population without, without help from wildlife officials or other humans. The fourth valley adjacent to Chemehueve Valley is the Cadiz Valley, where the company wants to mine Ice Age water, which would disrupt springs in the area, so tortoises, vegetation, other species will have less water available. So these four valleys south through the eastern end of Joshua Tree where there's designated wilderness is an especially important swath of habitat. Also near eastern Joshua Tree is the old Eagle Mountain shut iron ore mine where they have various lousy projects proposed for the area. However, the promise was to return that area into the national monument, what was the national monument at the time. So we need to protect those four valleys down through Joshua Tree and restore and and include as parkland the greater Eagle Mountain area. Thanks. All right, thank you so much for that, um, that input as well. 
Um, I'm going to mute you and lower uh, lower your hand or your verbally here. Mark, did you see anything come in while we were waiting, um, while we were listening to our commenter as well? Oh, you're muted. Still muted here. There okay. Sorry about that. No problem. Um, yeah, just a lot more of the uh, species in, in local areas like Panamint Valley and, and the like, fringe toad lizards. So um, pretty consistent. Um, people are really naming all the things that are most special about the, the desert area. That's great. And I want to remind um, folks who are on our interpretation lines as well, you can respond in Spanish. Um, and you can also, uh, if you're calling in as well, if you need to um, respond in Spanish, you can respond in Spanish and we'll have interpretation as well. Okay, I'm gonna take another um, 30 seconds or so here before we move on to our next question. I see the bighorn sheep, the Borregos, the Chukwala Mountains, the desert turtle, coyotes, natural community species that are indicators of community health. Okay. So I will move us on to our next question. Next question. Mark, do you want to take this one? I'm sure. Thinking about this region, what nature-based climate solutions are important to you? And remember some of the things that uh, Amanda said on various different types of climate um, uh, nature-based climate solutions. So recognizing the importance of the desert for carbon sequestration. So carbon sequestration is definitely a, a great nature-based solution. Solar on rooftops, um, more man-made, protecting habitat linkages, so connectivity, habitat restoration, um, drought planning, water conservation, reminder that some of the nature-based uh, climate solutions can be water and infiltration oriented. That's one that's come up a lot statewide. I know it's important to this region as well. Protecting desert soils and vegetation from grading, um, making golf courses more desert-like, so more natural. Protecting the desert water table from commercial extraction. Uh, farming practices, integrated habitat and water conservation, land trusts, that's one that's come up a fair amount across the state, um, more carbon sequestration. Mark, I saw a couple of Spanish responses in there too. I think I saw um, changing gardens into desert land, uh, take, changing landscaping to desert landscaping. Yeah, and I think there was a no pollution one in there too. Um, restoration no of... Oh, littering. Thank you. Restoration of wetlands, salt and sea. Cleaning up areas, I'm thinking. I do not speak Spanish, so Jenna, feel free to jump in on all of those. No problem. And our translators providing the translation in the chat box as well. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Victor. A lot of protection of the aquifers, land trusts coming up again. Um. Protecting the Imperial Valley water from urban demand. That one's on pesticides. Limiting development, preservation of habitat, controlling invasive grasses to reduce fires. I think not pesticides in water. Stopping litter, especially tires. The community education. Yeah, is there something, um, Jenna, you think on the definition of nature-based that we need to echo here since we're, we're getting a little bit of everything? Mm -hmm. I think for the nature-based climate solutions, Amanda mentioned community greening, habitat restoration, and climate smart agriculture. So I think, um, I'm seeing what's, I'm seeing responses that are um, 
that are talking about things that are very specific to the area as well. Um, yeah. So I think like the controlling against invasive and non-native, the tamarisk trees. Um, Restoring abandoned ag lands, that's a new one. Carbon sequestration, protecting intact native plant communities. So that was a good list of things right there. Um, habitat preservation. Mm -hmm. We have another minute or so on this question. Education. I think, um, Victor mentioned lake cleaning and lagoons as well. Okay. Invasives popped up a few times. This time it's protecting springs, so not just aquifers from degradation and draining. To match the tires, don't throw wheels in the streets as well. A lot, a lot of anti-pollution sorts of things that are being recommended here. Mm -hmm. Community greening, that, that's a good example of a nature-based climate solution. Pesticide control. Uh, less water intensive crops. Mm -hmm. Agricultural cover cropping, that's another good one. Eco parks, salt and sea restoration. I think we're winding down. All right, so let's move on to our next question. Um, and our next question is with regard to 30 by 30 or nature-based solutions, how can we advance equity and opportunity? So advancing equitable access to nature and recreation in this region. So not cutting down trees, but planning more. Engage impacted communities first. So how to advance equity and opportunity, engage impacted communities first. Restoring the Salton Sea. public access to natural areas, conserving <laughs> desert lands and, and open spaces, engaging with tribal communities, public participation, community engagement, Preventing sprawl development, so looking at what types of development would be good for the region. Punishment um, and funding, so maybe reducing, uh, looking at um, fines for people yeah. who do pollute. Prioritizing our marginalized communities with, with legislation. Looking at engaging environmental justice communities, working with uh, represented with um, elected officials, interpretation in multiple languages at outdoor spaces. Inviting politicians to work um, on environmental justice issues involving youth infrastructure that's inclusive, engaging underserved students from desert communities. There's one on ADA, ADA access, that's another important one. Educating people to respect the environment. So I'm uh, stopping police and immigration raids in outdoor spaces. So I'm seeing a lot of responses about collaboration, of inviting people who are impacted, um, working with community organizations, working with environmental justice, looking at education, involving youth, restoring native vegetation. We saw that response a couple times last time as well. Advocate for the environment. Looking at reparations from historic redlining. More funding for minority communities, teaching kids to respect the environment. The question is um, with regard to 30 by 30 and nature-based solutions, how can we advance equity and opportunity in the region? How can we advance 
equity and opportunity in the region. Transportation to outdoor spaces, educating the community, future generations um, can care for plants and animals. Looking at active and meaningful participation, funding for communities of color, looking at state parks and communities as well. I'm gonna take another one or two minutes on this question here. And as things have, have, have you've seen responses come in, if there's more that you, um, that come to mind, not cutting down trees, taking care of the parks, funding for youth programs like Gear Labs, outdoor education outings, youth job development, engaging with underrepresented um, people before decisions are made, more green spaces, clean energy, including solar and air, that nature and open spaces are within a 15 minute walk from all communities, that there's clean and renewable energy, that areas won't be privatized, there's incentives for solar energy and prioritizing solutions for the Salton Sea. Okay, there's such great and rich responses coming in on this question. I'm gonna move us on to keep us on time here. Um, so question four is what is working in the region to conserve lands? Um, and coastal waters, but lands and implement nature-based solutions to climate change. So we're interested in success stories. Um, Someone had ants and they deleted it. I was kind of bummed. Ants are always working. We're interested in existing <laughs> strategies and programs and projects. Yeah, <laughs> I did see ants come and then disappear. Um, so what is working? And as you consider your response, consider if there's any specific goals and targets that support these efforts. So Mark, do you wanna yep. work on these with me? Uh, national monument designations, uh, rooftop solar, again, national parks and monuments, salt and sea management plan to restore wetlands and suppress fugitive dust. A lot of promise there. State parks. Seeing a theme already. Yep. Habitat conservation plans for protection of endangered species. Protection of imperiled plants and animals under federal and state endangered species acts. Land trusts. The question again is what is working in this, re so what's actually working in this region to conserve lands and our coastal waters and implement nature-based solutions to climate change. Protection under the Wilderness Act, um, land trusts, um, carbon sequestration, uh, desert missing linkages reports, so habitat connectivity, allowing community members to partake in the decision-making process. Not using fertilizer wildlife refuges, wilderness designation. The Western Riverside County Regional Conservation Authority and HCP and NCCP. So that's good for, um, we greatly appreciate the specificity. That's really important for us. Thank you. Open spaces preserved through HCPs and land trusts, allowing farms to partake in participate in the decision process. The DRECP, the Desert Renewable Energy Conservation Plan, if followed. I'm sorry, I don't know the CVMSHCP. Assume Coachella Valley um, 
habitat conservation plan. Um, hopefully 30 by 30, we hope so too. The work of the Mojave Desert Land Trust to acquire land and restore desert lands. Two in a row on that, Mojave Land Trust. I thought it's, it's difficult to think of solutions when there's a lot um, of damage that's been done. But yeah. we'll think about opportunities too. Yep, and there'll be chances to talk about those later on. Mm -hmm. Wildlands Conservancy. Asking, asking Congress for help. Not having water diverted to metropolitan areas just for economic revenue. Community engagement to stop bad projects and sprawl. Support from electeds. Someone said add water. water. Yeah, <laughs> I saw that one. Um, reforestation. Enforcement of existing environmental law when it actually happens. UCR, UC Riverside Center for Conservation Biology. There's a hand raised, Jenna, I don't know. Habitat um, connectivity we, um, plan. Oh, go ahead, yeah, sorry. If your hand's raised, we'll message you real quick and make sure we get your answer in as well. Um, we're keeping raised hands for phone only users, but um, if your hand is raised, my team will message you now. Thanks. Okay. The Anza Borrego Desert Foundation. Lawsuits by working environmental with, NGOs. Go ahead. Yep. Uh, working with elected officials from the city. Federal designation of wilderness, national parks and monuments, California NCCPs, the DRECP, conservation easements. So there's a very comprehensive answer about what's working in the region. Even State Groundwater Management Act, SIGMA, um, supporting community-based organizations to help with community engagement. Community advocates. Respecting local community water rights. All right, let's take another 30 seconds or so here. Yeah, it's winding down. Okay. Protection through public land management along the lower Colorado. Federal NRCS programs. I think we're done. Okay. Well, let's move on to our next question. And like we asked before, we're gonna focus back in on equity here. So our next question is, what is working in the region to increase equitable access to nature and its benefits? If you're going on your browser, you can refresh your slide and you refresh your browser window and um, it will come up with the slide again if you haven't done that. Um, so refresh your browser window. So what is working in the region to increase equitable access to nature and its benefits? And again, for this one, we want success stories. We want programs. We want policies that are working and are working well. Um, the link to the chat, um, if you've just joined us, is in the, the link to this poll is in the chat as well. It's also on the screen. We have so many people responding. It just takes a little while sometimes to go on to the next um, question. So we'll wait here. But if you're typing in your responses, we're seeing them and they're coming in as well. Okay, I see cleaning the salt and sea. And cleaning where there are boats in the salt and sea. Advocacy by U.S. Congressman Vargas and Ruiz for the Salton Sea. That there's organizations that work with the community um, on public parks. 
the Research and Community Engagement from UC Riverside Center for Healthy Communities. Things that are working to increase access um, are bike trails, a unified appreciation for the outdoors, land trust, Restoration and the opportunity for free access, support from elected leaders. The free access to um, places that have already been privatized. The Mojave, the Mojave Trails non Monument. Seeing another answer here for land trust and mitigation banks. For clean public parks. Having interpreters available. And for our response here, um, we have a couple more minutes. We wanna hear of what is working to increase equitable access to nature and its benefits. Someone mentioned the benefit of knowing nature and being close to nature, that trail systems are uh, successful in increasing equitable access to nature. The wilderness areas near, near Palm Springs and in India where families can hike and picnic. Family-friendly areas and interpretation. Seeing programs led by the community. Free programs for, for people who can't um, pay or affordable programs, the CV Link, the Desert Discovery Center in Barstow. Looking at public spaces, not private spaces and clean waters in the new and Alamo River. So I'm gonna move us on to our next question and our next question, um, is focused on some things that we've talked about. The state of California is committed to conserving 30% of its lands and coastal waters by 2030. What does conservation mean to you? So what does conservation mean to you? So to frame this, the state has not yet defined conservation in this context. And we're interested to know what you think. So back to Jen's presentation, she described the state's approaches conserving places that protect species and meaningfully address and protect us from the effects of climate change. So what does conservation mean to you? So, so we've the seen sustainable, oh, sorry, Mark. We've, yeah, and we've seen education in the schools, managing for biodiversity, not private profit, um, sustainable viable ecosystems. Conservation means durable, permanent set aside of large contiguous valuable Habitat for wildlife and species protection. Natural spaces favored over development. Protection of habitats and communities. Um, future for the next generation. Protecting the ecosystem in the context of communities and franchisement. No development. Access with stewardship and monitoring. Acquisition of private lands for the purposes of habitat conservation for protected species in perpetuity. Healthy and sustainable ecosystems. If you step in on translation, feel free, Jenna. <laughs> um, definitely seeing some themes. Cleaner Rest planet. Restoration of lands degraded from mining, motorized recreation, et cetera, so that the productivity of vegetation can return and provide habitat. Removing cattle grazing from public lands, 
access to natural lands or towns and cities. Protecting the lakes and desert. Okay. We're seeing a lot of uh, recurring themes here. When someone conserves water, it goes to the environment, not allocated elsewhere. Good stewardship that allows future generations to experience the land in as close as possible to its original state. More permanent protection, supporting biodiversity, natural communities with eco regions that are healthy and species populations are sustained. Maintain recreation and subsistence fisheries in the Colorado. And if you're a phone call-in user, you can also dial star nine on your phone to provide your input as well. So star nine will give us the raised hand. Tribal lands respected and restored. Mm -hmm. Conserving the valley. Create better wetland habitats for fish and waterfowl, salt and sea. Enjoying the lakes and lagoons. No one should be allowed to dry up a river. Protecting the trees and plants. A chance to let some of our land recover and be given the respect it deserves as well as protect the species within them. Native people are stewards of their ancestral lands. Tribes have access and co-manage resources that are protected. Habitat connectivity. Preparing our people for the future. Water management with human right to clean water. The future is clean and beautiful for future generations or a clean future. Removing domestic livestock grazing from public lands throughout the region to restore natural communities and their key species populations such as desert tortoise and desert bighorn sheep. No more damage to desert habitat from the border patrol. Definitely a wide array of answers here. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. We have another minute or so on this question before moving on to the next. Sounds good. So the education of the environment. Human life is conserved as a priority before any other species or interest. Okay, so let's move on to our next question here. Um, our next question is on challenges. Our next question is on challenges. So we want to hear from you the greatest challenges to conserving lands and implementing nature-based solutions to climate change. So what are some key barriers to overcome? And you can have separate responses for each of the topics. So conserving lands, you can have a separate response or implementing nature-based solutions, a separate response. And take your time. We're looking for information needs, priorities, funding. If it's funding, funding for what? Um, so what is the greatest challenge to conserving land? All right, and so you were blocked out, Jenna. Um, renewable energy development in the desert, experiences in nature limited by economic inequities, um, lack of resources to protect and manage lands, oil and gas, funding blockage of progressive reform and disposal and usage, I assume, of land. People come from other parts of California to participate um, in motorized vehicles is damaging. 
HCPs and NCCPs don't have adequate funding. Funding again, and, and thank you for the specificity, this one in conservation and farming and the lack of return on the investment. Lack of political wills come up a couple of times. This, this one to achieve designations. Um, federal land management favoring extractive industries. Protecting link linkages between protected lands is a challenge. Lack I'm, of oh, go ahead. I'm back, back to you. And seeing if my if my sound is good. Thanks for being there, Mark. Are we good? You got it. You are okay. good. All right. I see privatization of parks as well. And Mark, you keep on with this question. Okay. Um, all right, in the desert region, renewable energy development, lack of integration and collaboration between all levels of government, lack of hearing field workers to make a change. So listening to them, fish and wildlife underfunded, development destroys, um, so development obviously is a challenge and impacts on ecosystems, altered fire regimes, so there's a climate one, gentrification, um, that's come up in a number of different regions. Special, um, farming regulation, uh, renewable energy next to the Salton Sea. So they're worried about mining with lithium extraction. See people littering tires and garbage, which we heard before as well. Sharing with the community that people um, aren't always aware of the animals and plants in the desert. The Cal Fire Vegetation Management Plan is not consistent with 30 by 30. Again, we're seeing extractive industry concerns, tourism. We have another minute or so on this question. Geothermal in the Imperial Valley, releasing heated water instead of recycling it adequately lack of regional open space development planning in local county and federal jurisdictions, outmoded federal mining laws, lack of partnership investment from large produce buyers and conservation, people dumping, using the desert as a dumping ground. I think it's a, can move on to the next one, Jenna. All right, let's move on. Okay, so our next question is the greatest challenges to increasing equitable access to nature and its benefits. So what are the barriers that need to be overcome for equity and access? And I see dollar signs on the screen. So funding, and I wanna ask funding for what specifically? So if we can get into questions on funding, funding for what? Are there other challenges to increasing equitable access to nature and its benefits? Develop lands obstruct recreation areas. Funding specifically for maintenance. Places that have um, multiple languages or that are bilingual. The need for investment in education, jobs in the desert ecosystem, coastal areas. People in jobs aren't paid enough to afford rec recreation. Transportation, sometimes these places are remote. The challenge is the real estate industry. 
the equitable preservation of unique open spaces adjacent to private land holdings. Funding, and again, funding specifically as well. Excessive water consumption for resorts for wealthy people. That there are private places that are exclusive and people are unable to access. Okay, so our question is, um, the greatest challenges to increasing equitable access to nature and its benefits. And again, if you're a phone call and user, star nine to let us know the greatest challenges or barriers to increasing equitable access to nature. See historical redlining and people of color who are excluded from living in desirable areas. We don't know the history of our of the earth. <laughs> Unincorporated areas did not have access to funds. Went down really quick, but I saw an answer that had to do with racism. The lack of minimum wage. That low income families might not have um, resources or money to access nature and its benefits, that hotels are affordable for visitors, the lack of minimum wage and paid vacation, ensuring parks and public places are accessible to disabled, so ADA accessibility, funding that benefits high income areas, We need to have more um, preparation in schools and more education. That there isn't enough education about the earth, about our world, and the environment. Transportation to different places. It's one on tribes a while back to make sure that they were um, heavily engaged on access. Ice patrolling border communities, creating fear. Another note on ADA accessibility, taking into account all social classes and race. Greatest challenges to increasing ex equitable access to nature and its benefits. Elected officials representing corporations, maybe not people or the environment. Field trips for kids in school. All right, so let's move on to our next question here. Our next question is on um, regional opportunities. And the, there, this is our third topic and we have two questions in this topic area here. Again, star nine on your phone. We wanna know what long-term success for nature-based climate solutions look like in this region. So big picture, future-oriented, big question, big picture. What does success look like for nature-based solutions? You can think high level. You can also think um, project-based as well. So what does success look like for nature-based solutions? I'll start with our raised hand here. Um, 7056, we'll unmute you here. Thanks. South Coast Wildlands sees a key desert area as the Joshua Tree to 29 Palms Connection, they call it, on scwildlands.org. This area is fairly similar to my advised swath of desert habitat to protect from the eastern Joshua Tree area up through the essential desert tortoise valleys, Fenner, Ward, Chemueve, plus toss in the Cadiz Valley. So protecting this general region would certainly be success. Thank you. Thank you. Habitat connectivity is on there. Public lands protected from development. The people are content and happy. <laughs> happy communities. Okay. 
that we're working more with Congress. Connected network of state and national parks, so connectivity, being able to breathe clean air and enjoy clean water, conserving desert land in both San Bernardino and Riverside County, protected from extractive development, self-sustaining in terms of electricity and aquifer, so water supply, enough water um, for desert springs and wetlands, and people have high quality water, so better water management, to work with each other, not against each other. Taking into account comments. Healthy open spaces and forested areas, full implementation of HCP and NCCP conservation plans, Western Riverside County. Desert lands are protected at a landscape level, no more checkerboard ownership. A national monument established between Santa Rosa Mountains and Joshua Tree National Park climate-informed regional HCP, habitat conservation plan, um, clean energy, no fugitive dust, harming people's health in the Imperial Valley. It's a good one. The environment's given in enough consideration the projects that harm it are modified or rejected. I see there's one on asthma and kids. Kids can breathe clean air who have asthma. Socioeconomic state. Oh, go ahead. Nope. More people visiting public places. Socioeconomic status doesn't determine the health of a community. Desert landscape, again, connectivity, wildlife corridors, that's come up a few times. Big picture, healthy, functioning, natural, and human communities. Increasing biodiversity. Water flows in both the Colorado and all the way to uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Mexican wolves, the Mojave National Preserve. Decreasing respiratory illnesses. No more loss of natural desert habitats for solar energy projects, military base expansions, livestock grazing, on public lands and sustainable groundwater use. To make all these long terms successful and turn into history to remember all these changes. Marginalized people don't live near warehouses or landfills. So an environmental justice point. A mountain lion can travel safely from Mexico to Death Valley and beyond. Sonoran pronghorn are reintroduced and thriving. Some innovative ideas here. This is cool. That everyone can access public areas, public access for all. Remove the border wall where it interferes with wildlife movement. We enjoy the natural environment without pollution or contamination. Now we're really getting creative. Jaguars back in the Santa Rosa and San Jacinto Mountains. Healthy living in healthy communities. Um, without contamination and that there are, are no longer dumps in the area. Communities have equitable access to the resources they need. Animals that are on the brink of extinction to reproduce. The desert pupfish thrive at Dos Palmas and San Sebastian Marsh. We return the land to indigenous communities. I think we're winding down a bit. Okay. So we're right at our time here. Um, so I will have us go on to our next and final question. Our next and final question is what does success look like for 3030? What does success look like for 3030? And so in your thinking about 
ahead nine years to 2030, what do you hope will happen in your region? This could be higher regional level or project specific. So what is happening in 2030? What does success look like? Yeah, you may even want to write down where you'd like the 30% protected to be that isn't already protected. So new areas is an example. And while we wait for this to load, I want to thank everyone for um, participating, for our translators and interpreters, um, and for just the rich responses we're getting in so specific to the region. The pace of plant climate change in the region has slowed. 30% of or more of land is conserved by 2030 anywhere in California. Seeing success is that there's no more conversion of unique open space for development, that we reach the goal, that 30% of the desert is protected. Looking at it, quite a few responses to um, development not being on um, new land. The Western Joshua tree is no longer threatened, that we're an example for other states. Seeing some coastal area restoration as well and preservation for the new generation to make the same, the, uh, these same solutions are better. So I'm gonna mention Mesa and Panamint Valleys needing greater protection. There's metrics and recordings of all conserved lands. That we continue for many years past this. That we're an example for all. BLM lands are protected, that the desert tortoise populations are healthy and have enough food to eat, that we are committed to action. Wildlife corridors are intact. Wildlife can move freely about the desert habitat. A better alternative to lithium is discovered and we don't have to fight mining any longer the note to have this be national, that we are in California an example. So we'll step, spend another minute or so here on this question, what success looks like for 3030. Success looking like improved and enlarged wildlife corridors, that politicians are fully committed to conserving land and work clo working closely with marginalized groups, that we're working well with Congress, that other states are participating in 30 by 30, that there's representation and accessibility for all communities. It's great to see the Biden administration so bold on 30 by 30 already, um, just in the last few weeks, it's been amazing. Mm -hmm. California is an example of conservation and biodiversity. California is the example, again. Conservation is the norm, not something we have to fight. Accountability for environmental crimes. that we can continue, um, well, I'll say more power, power at a higher level. That the whole world goes by 30 by 30 or 30 by 50. That biodiversity is increased for future generations. We're able to follow up with public officials and officials in our cities. Companies report on what they're doing for 30 by 30. There's a love for the land, love for nature. 
that we're preserving aquifers and groundwater. And again, what does success look like for 30 by 30? That human health is prioritized over any other interest across the nation. Okay. But the desert tortoise population and critical habitat units are on a path to recovery. So we have healthy communities. And as we close out in these next um, 30 or so seconds, I wanted to remind folks that if your answer is here, it's recorded. If I didn't see it or read it out, read it, read it out. If I didn't read it out loud, um, we have it on poll everywhere, and it will be part of our um, of our report and our summary. That our kids enjoy 2030, but there's no habitat and species extinction. That you don't have to worry about breathing the air in Imperial County. That folks are more aware that California is known not for is known for nature and not for business. Si se puede, 30 by 30, we can do it. Okay, well, let's um, end on that note here. Um, I'm gonna have us go on in the next slide where I thank you for sharing your ideas and experiences during today's meeting. And as a reminder, the workshop has been recorded and will be available online at our website, www.californianature.ca.gov. We will be posting meeting summaries with non-attributable comments captured during these meetings. You can also provide feedback on today's experience by completing a post-workshop evaluation that will be emailed to you. And we invite you to stay connected by visiting our website, www.californianature.ca.gov. There you can provide additional written comments through the public uh, input questionnaire and sign up for one of our future events. Again, thank you so much for the rich and robust conversations here. We really appreciate your time. I'm gonna turn it over uh, back over to Mark for any final words. Um, sure, thanks. Um, just briefly, uh, greatly appreciate the fact that everybody hung in there for the whole time and really shed a great deal of light and provide us with a lot of information on the unique biodiversity to the desert region, as well as the unique challenges that you're facing within those regions. Um, you expressed it quite well and gave us a wide variety of really strong recommendations that um, we'll definitely discuss and ponder and, and think about moving forward. So thank you so much and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Um, and in your chat as well, um, there's the link to, uh, there's information on how you can email in, um, provide written comments um, through the mail or leave a voicemail as well. Um, but this meeting is now over. So you can leave by exiting out um, through Zoom. You can also click leave on the bottom of your screen. Again, we appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us this evening and we'll see you next time. Thanks.